I must confess that I didn't know Corselli before I was offered Achille and Shiro. Uh, for, to my defense, most people I ask, uh, do you know Corselli? I'm doing Achille and Shiro by Corselli. Most people, even music specialists, will answer, who? <laughs> so no, I didn't know Corselli, but I did listen to what was available uh, of his music. Unfortunately, not Achille and Shiro. Well, doing a piece that is unknown or rediscovery is very different from doing a repertoire opera because it, you don't have a recording. And usually what I do is I listen to the music over and over again to get ideas and to get inspiration. In this case, of course, you can't listen to the music of Achille and Shiro over and over again because it does not exist. So um, I had to do it using a libretto first, which is not ideal uh, because if you do opera, you're going to work with the libretto and the music. And working with the libretto only is like working with half of the material. It's like staging a theatre play and doing half of the lines or half of the scenes. So it's quite frustrating. But um, luckily, we, we got a score that was edited uh, during the process. And I could I, you know, I read enough music that I could read the score and try and figure out what the music was going to be like um, and have an idea of the music. And then the opera very kindly organised a recording of the piece uh, with a pianist who sang and played <laughs> the, all of the parts of and all the music of Achille and Shiro so that we could actually listen to the music and, 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 and get an idea, a more precise idea of what it was going to sound like. But it's a very unusual uh, process, which is really like doing a world premiere or a contemporary opera. What's really appealing in the libretto when you read it at first is this, conf this gender confusion. Uh, the idea that we have a Greek hero, and not any Greek hero, but Achille, who's the masculine warrior, wearing a skirt for half of the opera, <laughs> dressed as a woman. So that's quite unusual, that's quite funny, and that's quite appealing, uh, especially for today's audiences and today's problematics. Uh, so that's one very interesting element. Uh, all the more as it gets developed, Achille is in love with Deidamia, but he's dressed as a girl, and then arrives Theagene, the prince who's supposed to marry Deidamia, and he notices Achille, disguised as a woman, and he says, hmm, that's a very sexy girl. So we have a male prince sung by a woman, because the role of Theagene is sung by a woman. So a male prince sung by a woman, who's sexually attracted to a man dressed as a woman, sung by a countertenor. So that's a lot of layers of gender confusion that makes it very appealing and, and fun. And so there are a lot of very tragic comic elements. Of course, it gets more and more serious as the piece goes by, and it gets very sad and tragic, and, uh, tragic, and it becomes this conflict between love and glory or duty. But in the first half of the opera, there are a lot of comic elements, which makes it a very good mix and a very appealing libretto for a director. That's definitely one of the very appealing things in the libretto. The other interesting thing about this opera is that we see the youth of a very famous hero, which is in a way very touching. We see Achille before he's Achille. We see the young Achille, who's, who has a lot of characteristics of the future Achille. You know, he gets angry very quickly, he's very masculine, he's very, but he's still very young. And we see in the course of the opera how Achille becomes Achille. That's quite touching. And we also have Ulisse. So we have these known mythological figures who appear and who interact. And that's, all, that, that's also very appealing in the libretto of Achille and Shiro. The image of love that we have in Achille and Shiro is also very interesting because at the beginning of the opera we have Deidamia, the princess, and Achille, the hero disguised as a woman, as Pirra, who are in love. And in a way, it's a very symmetrical kind of love because you have Deidamia and her friend Pirra, uh, who's a man, of course, but formally they're like two girls. So there are absolutely no, there is no uh, domina relationship of domination or superiority. It's very equal and very symmetrical, symbolically. And then as the opera goes on, we break that symmetry. And especially Ulisse is there to reestablish the right order of how things are supposed to be like, which is the woman should be in love, and the man, it's fine if he's in love, but he shouldn't be only in love. The man has to be a lover and a warrior, and a man has to be both. And we have no symmetry anymore by the end of the opera. Achille 
of course, is still in love with Deidamia and he marries her. But he should also be able to leave her and go to war because that's where he's being called. Deidamia stays Deidamia and Deidamia stays in love and that's all she does and she has to stay there. So in a way there is also a sort of moral um, imperative going on in the opera, breaking the liberty and the equality and the gender fluidity that we have at the beginning and establishing something that's morally very strict and very conventional and much more going towards you know, the, the morals of opera in the 19th century as we know them. You know, men are men and women are women and we know where they stand. And that's also a very interesting uh, dramaturgical aspect of Achille and Shiro is that within one opera between Act 1 and the end of Act 3 we, in a way, have the evolution of male-female uh, roles in opera between the 17th century and the 19th century. And Achille and Shiro, 1745, is just in the middle of that evolution. One thing that was very interesting for us is that Achille and Shiro was composed for a special occasion for a royal wedding between the Infanta de España and the Dauphin de France, Louis de France, the son of Louis XV. Um, so it was composed for, this, for the celebration in Madrid, in, in honour of the wedding, uh, before the princess went to France and had the, the French celebrations for the actual wedding in Versailles, uh, where Platé was composed for the same wedding. It's just interesting for me because I have done Platé, so now I've done both, both operas for the same wedding. Um, and you could ignore that fact, but it's actually difficult to ignore because the very last scene of the opera, of Achille and Shiro, um, is actually a direct address to the king with Licomede, the king of our opera, turning to the king in the audience and saying, Signor, we are now celebrating uh, you know, the wedding of your daughter and the, prince, the French prince. And there is a chorus that celebrates, the final chorus celebrates that wedding. So we completely break the story and, uh, and we go with historic reality. As a director, you can decide to ignore it or to use it. And we decided to use it because it's quite interesting. We have a piece that celebrates Achille and Deidamia, their love, and their wedding in the end because the king says Achille and Deidamia should get married and then Achille should go to war. So we have the perfect prince, Achille, who is marrying his beloved and going to war. He's the perfect balance between love and glory. And we have a real life situation with a real prince and a real princess marrying. The thing is, the end of the opera is a happy end, or is presented as a happy end, except that everyone in the audience knows that Achille is going to die. So everyone says, oh, that's wonderful. Achille gets to marry Damia and then he goes to war and he will come back and you'll be very happy. But Achille will not come back. He will, he will die at the Trojan War. So it's not a very happy ending, actually. And I thought, that's quite strange, you know, to take this opera, which doesn't really have a happy ending, if you know your mythology, and you know, they did, to celebrate a royal wedding. And the irony is that that wedding that was being celebrated did not, did not end very well either, because the princess died give, almost giving birth after she gave birth, a year after she, got, uh, she arrived in France. So in a way, it's almost as if this opera was a bad omen for that wedding. And I thought that was quite moving, you know, what does this princess think when she's seeing this opera that's uh, supposed to celebrate her wedding? What is she supposed to learn from this? How is she supposed to understand the characters and the moral of the story and the ending? And it got me thinking about this princess and who she was and how she understood this opera and whether this opera was a kind of, you know, lesson for life for her. The title of Achille in Shiro um, tells us about a character and a place, Shiro, Skiros, an island. And how do you represent an island on stage? That's not very easy. But I think it's very important that it's an island because an island is somewhere you cannot leave. And Achille is stuck on that island and he cannot leave Shiro. That's one of the important things in the story. He's a kind of prisoner in a way. Um, and we try to find sets that give this impression of being trapped somewhere, of being slightly claustrophobic. Um, it's not an island, but it's something else. Um, 
and I think what you also have to convey in the sets is that Achille is not only a prisoner, but he's also being protected by his mother because his mother sent him to Shiro in order for him not to be killed in the war. So in a way, it's also the story of a boy who's overprotected by his mother, his mother trying to keep him in her womb. Um, and our set, which is, if I can reveal that much, a cave, I think symbolizes that. It's Achille being trapped in a cave, which is something very maternal, very feminine also, very sexual also, um, but something that's slightly claustrophobic or uh, claustrophobic also. Um, also, I think it's interesting to have something that has to do with the classical world, with antiquity, but also with the 18th century, because we're referring to that royal wedding in 1745. And um, a cave, in a way, is something that's very 18th century, you would think of, you know, artificial caves or, you know, grottos in, in uh, gardens and something that has to do with um, antiquity, with, uh, with uh, archaeology, with, uh, with an ancient world that's kind of trapped in a cave. So we have this, um, this world that is also a fantasy world. It was very important for us to have a, a universe of its own, something that's not realistic, something that is not a transposition, but something that is fantasy, because we, we're talking about mythology. So I think it's important to create a visual universe that's very strong and very appealing, and something that is a, a world of its own, with, with references, with an aesthetic that, that, that is just belongs to that place, that magic place. Strangely enough, I think having a piece that no one knows makes the storytelling easier. When everyone knows the piece, everyone comes with different expectations and everyone has an idea of how it should be. Everyone has an idea of, you know, who Violetta is or who Carmen is, or, but no one has an expectation of who Deidamia is or who Achille is in this piece. And that makes our life very easy. I don't think my job is different from any other production I've done, I consider my job storytelling, telling the story to the audience in the clearest way that is possible and, you know, adding interpretations, emotions, references, of course. But storytelling is a very important part of my job as I conceive it. And with an unknown piece, everyone is on the same level. We're all on the same level. I don't have any preconceptions either. So all I have is me, the singers, you know, and the team, the conductor, and this story. And that's all, nothing else, no parasite, no layers of expectations, interpretation. And we were in direct contact with the audience because that's all they have too. So in a way it makes the storytelling very nice and very easy and very fluid, I think. I think you have to use the libretto, which is a very good libretto, because it's metastasio, so the storytelling is really quite wonderful. And work with the singers, and we have a wonderful cast. We have singers who are real actors, um, and characterize the characters and the relationships, and there you go with the storytelling. Even the gender confusion, the, the cross-dressing, I think, are dosed very well, because it's complex enough that it's a good story, but it's clear enough that it's very easily understood. And of course, that's metastasio. The fact that we have cross-dressing in Achille and Shiro could be confusing, of course, but it, it's not because, it, the situation, because the situations are quite clear. And actually, it's great for the storytelling because it uh, gives us very, a lot of occasions to have very funny situations. Of course, Achille the hero in a dress or in a skirt is wonderful because you have men flirting with him and you have Achille being frustrated. You can also have Achille all of a sudden not knowing who he is anymore and being attracted to a man who's flirting with him. You know, we know the later story of Achille. We, have, we know Achille and Patrocle and, uh, you know, we know what's going to happen. So in a way, all that is there already. Um, so I think the cross-dressing is actually a very rich thing and it's, it's not confusing. It's, it just, it's just wonderful material. 1745 is kind of in between for me um, and it's interesting because in many ways it reminds of uh, 17th century Venetian plots, 
you know, with gender confusion, cross-dressing, quiproquos, and, and, and tragicomic, like you can have in Cavalli, which I've worked on quite a lot. Um, and in another way, you have this very opera seria conflict between love and, and uh, glory or honor, uh, which, is, uh, which is also something I'm familiar with. And, and Achille and Shiro is in between, which makes it very interesting. Um, it is a very strict succession of recitative da capo aria, recitative da capo aria, no ensembles, except for a few chorus parts and the, cor the chorus and the end. And it can seem quite dry at the beginning. It's quite long da capo arias. Um, but I think if you're going to do a piece, you have to trust the piece as it is. I don't think you should try and make a piece something that it isn't. So I don't think we should try and pretend that Achille Shiro is not an opera that has recitativo and da capo arias. There are ways of making it more fluid. There are ways of making the da capo arias talk about one thing, then another, address one person, address another person. And the text of the da capo arias is always something I love to work with because it's really one sentence that gets repeated over and over again. And while some people may find that tedious, I think it's wonderful because I think even in real life, one sentence can mean a million things. And so you have the occasion within one aria to say the same thing with very different subtexts that are given to you by the situation or the music or the other characters. That's actually very rich. You don't need to fill with ideas or you know, action or other characters or you know, people jumping around on stage. I think you have to trust the music and the singing and the vocality uh, and the singers and the situations. I think if you always come back to the situation and what's happening and what's going on, then it's never boring because you're really telling a story. And sometimes people say, well, it's long. And I say, well, you know what? In real life, this situation also would probably last for five or six minutes. It's not that long, <laughs> you know, if you actually think of it in terms of situation and emotion and text and subtext. So that, that, that's never a problem for me. And I don't think you should have a recipe for a da capo aria. I don't think you should say, ah, A, B, A, and this is how I treat it. I think each da capo aria is different and you treat it in a different way. But I think the danger is when you start to think, how am I going to fill the aria with things? You don't have to fill an aria, you have to feel an aria, which is not the same thing. You, you know, have to understand what's going on. I think one should come to Achille and Shiro because it's good to see things that you don't know. And I think it's good to go to the opera, not just to, know the, to see the pieces that you know by heart already, but to discover new pieces, because I think that's the history of opera. I think people, during centuries, went to the opera to see new pieces, not pieces that they knew by heart. And that was how those pieces, which we now know by heart, and our museum pieces, were created. There were new pieces that people went to discover, not knowing the music, not knowing the story, not knowing what it was going to be like. And that was how opera was born and how opera was alive for centuries and centuries. It might be different now, but I think in a way, we're closer to the history of opera and to all these pieces that we know very well now when we see new pieces because this is what opera was. You know, it was like going to the cinema and seeing a new film, which we do now. I love seeing old movies that I've seen a million times and I do it, but I also like going to the cinema and discovering new films. And I have to say this one is just very good. It's very good music. The libretto is very good and we have a wonderful cast. We have amazing singers. Um, we're having a lot of fun in the rehearsals. It's a very nice process and it's really coming together. And I think it's very exciting for us too because we're also discovering it and we see it coming together and we're starting to have the feeling that it, it works, it's working, it's, it's, it's coming to life. And that's very exciting and I think that can be very exciting for the audience.